Thank you so much for coming, and you're coming to what I think will be a very auspicious occasion, uh, because Tom Bartlett, our speaker, is uh, he's both one of the most eminent and the most popular of Irish historians, if I can put it like that. Uh, and that's, that's not a, a, a uniform combination of, uh, across, across all academics. Um, so we're absolutely delighted to have him. We had Tom here, was it two years ago, Tom? Three years ago? Uh, three years ago, uh, to give a, a Notre Dame lecture, and uh, it was absolutely memorable. Uh, and uh, I, I just got, I just sketched out very briefly. Uh, are you from Belfast originally? Yeah, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, a North of Ireland man. Uh, and that brings, that brings perspectives that actually um, are a bit different from what a lot of Irish historians bring uh, and allows a, a way of looking at Ireland that not everybody, I would say, further south has, actually. Uh, and I think it sharpens perspectives in a number of ways. But anyway, Tom, my, you correct me if I'm wrong, Tom. I associate you with Galway initially, spending several years mm -hmm. in University College Galway, uh, then getting the chair of Irish history, presumably in the University College Dublin, for again several years, and then being headhunted by uh, a new Irish studies centre in Aberdeen, which had a good deal of Glucksman support, incidentally. It wasn't entirely coincidental, and whose, whose rector at that time, or president, whatever they're called, had been dean of the Faculty of Arts here. So there are connections that one might not suspect. Um, and then Tom, when he retired from there, uh, was headhunted, in a sense, by Notre Dame. And you've been back and forth in Notre Dame for a number of years in, in my, my image of the way you spend your life. So he's a much sought after man in very fine institutions and very deservedly so. Uh, he's extremely well published, which one cannot say of all Irish historians, but uh, certainly Tom has managed wherever he has been uh, to have sustained publication. Uh, in, I've got a lot of titles here, Tom, but the ones that are, he'd be best known for, The Fall and Rise of the Irish Nation, The Catholic Question, 1690 to 1830, and then one on Theobald Wolfe Tone. Uh, and the, the, um, the one that I, we were talking about the last time you were here, or at least that I was mentioning, the, the history, he's the, I was going to say far and away the best, maybe I shouldn't say far and away, that's unkind to, to uh, absent friends, the best one volume history of Ireland, uh, going from St. Patrick uh, to virtually the present day. Uh, uh, and uh, a fantastic achievement, actually. I'm not saying that because it's here. It's very few of us are able to range over 15 centuries and write with authority and with perception and with depth uh, in the way Tom has over the 15 centuries, based on extraordinary wide reading and uh, very sustained deep thinking. So it is, it's a, a pleasure, it's a pleasure to have him, it's a pleasure to have him as himself, which again, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily say of all our colleagues. Um, and it's a, pleasure to, it's a pleasure to have him, a pleasure to have him as a truly major historian. So Tom, you're very, very welcome. So good luck all by all right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I was very pleased to be asked to be here, talk to you this evening. Um, as I say, I was pleased to be asked, and I'm pleased to be here. Um, my topic is Napoleon Bonaparte and Ireland. And this is a subject, of course, on which much could be written. It's not just the involvement of Napoleon Bonaparte with the plans of Theobald Wolfe Tone and Robert Emmett to conjure up a French army of invasion during the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Such projects are a matter of historical record for which documents exist and which can be assessed and evaluated. More than this, however, is the historical significance of Napoleon. His meaning first in Irish popular consciousness in what you might call the long 19th century, and then second, his place in Irish revolutionary thinking in terms of obtaining military assistance from abroad. In an Irish context, to an extent, these twin aspects of Napoleon's legacy, that is to say the popular, aspect and the revolutionary can be separated and seen as on the one hand Napoleonism. Um, Napoleonism is essentially or was essentially a sentimental, nostalgic, romantic view of the emperor preoccupied with his victories, his achievements, his sayings and I think as well the affecting circumstances concerning um, surrounding his exile on St Helena and death. I mean who could not feel to be moved by his swift fall from being emperor of half the world to being confined to a barren lump of rock in the South Atlantic. This view of Napoleon is largely devoid, I think, of political content. 
Against that, however, there is something that we might call Bonapartism, which was overtly political and potentially revolutionary. It equated Bonaparte with the French Revolution and with republicanism, and of course it blithely ignored the inconvenient truths about Bonaparte. He was the man who brought an end to the French Republic after all. He suppressed all legislative opposition. He practiced the most draconian censorship in French history. He organized a police force of redoubtable efficiency. He re-established a nobility and he reimposed slavery in the Caribbean colonies. Nonetheless, Bonaparte was admired um, because what he was seen to be doing was marrying what you might call martial vigor with civic virtue. And I think these two paths, Napoleonism and Bonapartism, converge in Ireland in 1916. But first, as in all assessments of Napoleon and his impact, the primary difficulty is always in separating fact from fantasy, myth from reality, and prizing apart the legacy, the legend, and the whimsy. And may I illustrate this point? It was recorded in 1819 that but for the quick-thinking actions of an Irish priest, Napoleon would never have been able to conquer half the world. Indeed, the world would never have heard of him. Father Edward Redmond, parish priest of Ferns, County Wexford, from 1786 until 1818, had, as a student in France, apparently made a dramatic rescue of the boy Bonaparte, who had fallen into a river near to the college where Redmond was studying. Redmond had pulled him to safety, and the rest is what? History <laughs> or fantasy? <laughs> then there are the many Irish connections of Napoleon's family. We can't disregard the claim that Napoleon's grandfather was an O'Donovan from Kilkenny. There is no evidence for this. <laughs> but we are on firmer ground in pointing out that Napoleon's older brother Joseph married the daughter of an Irish merchant, Francis Clary, in Marseille. She eventually became Queen of Spain. And Jerome, the youngest of Napoleon's brothers, married Elizabeth Patterson, the daughter of an Irish merchant in Baltimore, Maryland, much to Bonaparte's uh, displeasure. As for Napoleon himself, we learn that in his youth he was rejected, dumped by Desiree Clary, another daughter of Francis Clary and the sister of Joseph's wife. According to Montalon, who was a sort of Boswell uh, to Napoleon when he was in exile, Desiree remained afterwards Napoleon's one true love. She subsequently married Marshal Bernadotte, a bitter rival of Napoleon, and eventually became Queen of Sweden. One writer has mused, it is interesting to speculate whether the career of Napoleon might have been different if he had married her with her splendid character and qualities rather than Josephine, an adventuress of dubious morals. <laughs> Let's leave genealogy to one side. There's the claim of the well-known silversmiths, Bradfords of Clonmel, County Tipperary, that Napoleon used to shave with razors made by them. So who could refute that boast, and who would really want to, by appointment to the emperor? And of course, there is Napoleon's favorite stallion, Marengo, named after his famous victory in Italy in 1801, a horse that carried him through Austerlitz, Wagram, the Russian campaign of 1812, and Waterloo, was wounded many times. The horse died aged 38. It remained a prime attraction in circuses and shows, though alas, a failure at stud. And its skeleton is on display to this day in the National Army Museum in Chelsea. Some years ago, it was subject to a charming, uh, to the subject of a charming biography. A biography biographies of horses are not that <laughs> copious. Now, given the well-attested love of the Irish for horses, it was inevitable that a claim would be made for Irish ownership. Moringo was asserted to have been bred in Wexford and purchased at the horse fair in Ballinasloe, County Galway, for the sum of 100 guineas. Not surprisingly, the local tourist office is fiercely protective of the connection, and there is today a rather grand restaurant in the town, the Moringo, which celebrates the Napoleonic link. Well, is any of this true? The family details are supported by the evidence, that is, the sisters and so on marrying into various merchant families, but the rest is, I fear, highly problematic. But intriguingly, Bonaparte claimed to have suffered a near-death experience as a 17-year-old youth in France. 
His story of a near drowning surfaced in Barry O'Mara's Napoleon in Exile, which was published in 1822. However, in this version, Bonaparte maintained that he was able to struggle ashore unaided, and there's no mention of a priest. But the story was current in Wexford in 1812, and Father Redmond died in 1818, four years before O'Mara's book came out. Redmond's role in the incident was brought to a wider audience in Father Kavanagh's A Popular History of the Wexford Insurrection of 1798, first published in 1870. The story, I think, is best regarded as unproven, but it's still significant that a connection between a Wexford priest and Napoleon was thought worthwhile to make in 1870. As for Marengo, the available evidence seems to point to the horse being of Barbary stock and to have been captured or purchased in the aftermath of the Battle of Abukir Bay in Egypt. It was an Egyptian stallion. The Ballinasloe connection possibly may date from Thackeray's novel Vanity Fair, 1847, where the words Marengo, Balnaslow, and horse appear in the same sentence. <laughs> we are, I think, on firmer ground in addressing Bonaparte's connection with the United Irishmen. From the 1690s on, as we know, successive Irish governments had to keep a close eye, kept a close eye on French military planning that might conceivably include an invasion of Ireland. French officer cadets in the French military academies had routinely been set as an exercise, an incursion into Ireland. Little had come of these, as we know. But by the mid-1790s, the French revolutionary authorities had finally begun to take seriously a descent on Ireland. At the very least, a small French force would tie up a large number of British soldiers. At best, it might succeed. Look at what Bonaparte, with a relatively small army, had done in Italy in 1796-97. Ireland could be another Italy for a lucky French general. Ireland would be detached from Britain, and Britain would be deprived of Irish recruits for the army and navy, and of provisions for both. The future Hibernian Republic would join the Cisalpine Republic, the Batavian Republic, and other satellite republics of France. Britain would be surrounded and would have no alternative but to concede. And in addition, in addition, and no small matter, an invasion of Ireland would undoubtedly ignite a sectarian civil war and would therefore be a well-deserved payback for Pitt, William Pitt, who had infamously stirred up counter-revolution in the Vendée and who had acted as paymaster of the agrarian insurgency there, known as La Chouannerie. Pitt would find that Ireland would be his Vendée. So we know that, Napoleon, that Theobald Wolfe Tone had a number of meetings uh, with uh, Bonaparte between December 1797 and January 1798. As the recent conqueror of Italy, Napoleon's reputation was soaring, and news of his victories over the Austrians had penetrated to remote parts of Europe. Miles Byrne, United Irishman, and later soldier in the Grand Armée of Bonaparte, more than 60 years later recalled what he described as the happy days in Monaseed, County Wexford, when, with pulse racing, quote, we used to read at the chapel the newspapers giving an account of Napoleon's brilliant campaigns from 1795 down to the Peace of Campo Formio in 97. Around the same time as Byrne was reading about Napoleon's exploits, a man was arrested in Oran Moor, County Galway, for drinking this toast. Gavekime Shorsha, a crohu la corda, agus a kraken marbroga or Bonaparte. It may we see George hanged by a rope, George III, and his skin used to make boots for Bonaparte. <laughs> and when Henry O'Kane disembarked with General Humbert at Killala, County Mayo, he sought to impose his will on the local inhabitants and waved his sword over his head and claimed that the sword he had in his hand was given to him by General Bonaparte. Indeed, in the folklore associated with the French raids in 1798, it was Bonaparte who had actually come to Ireland not the obscure Humbert. Ta na Frankie anish a stig a kilala, a gizbeimij galahan lauger. Ta Bonaparte a gashlan a wari, a giri on dli a chap sharsel. The Irish are now in Kalala, and we will be broad and strong. Bonaparte is now in Castle Bar, seeking to enact Sarsfield's law. But more elevated witnesses could be swept away by Napoleon's awesome reputation. In May 1798, Lieutenant General James Stewart Reichley announced that he had in fact captured Napoleon Bonaparte off the Cork coast. And given Napoleon's extraordinary military standing throughout Europe, 
It's no wonder that a rather odd Theobald Wolfe Tone should comment in his diary that it is droll enough that he, an Irish exile, a relative of Nawn, with no military standing, travelling under the non de plume of Jim Smith, should be writing to Bonaparte seeking an interview. The pair duly met during the third week of December 1797 at Bonaparte's house, and here is Tone's account. He, Bonaparte, lives in the greatest simplicity. His house is small but neat, and all the furniture and ornaments in the most classical taste. He's about five foot six high and well made, but stoops considerably. He looks at least ten years older than he is, owing to the great fatigues he underwent in his immortal campaign of Italy. His face is that of a profound thinker, but bears no mark of that great enthusiasm and unceasing activity by which he has been so much distinguished. It is rather, to my mind, the countenance of a mathematician than of a general. He has a fine eye and great firmness. He speaks low and hollow, so much for his manner and figure. But as for Ireland and Irish affairs, Tone recorded his disappointment that Bonaparte appears a good deal uninformed. For example, he seems convinced that our population is not more than two million, which is nonsense. Bonaparte listened but said very little. We may note that another of Bonaparte's Irish visitors recorded that the great man believed that Ireland was infested with wolves, and yet another recalled that Bonaparte, quote, seemed to understand nothing of this noble island of Ireland, more than a general idea of its religious differences. He erroneously thought the entire country was Catholic. Afterwards, I knew that he entertained a very poor idea of the Irish nation. A further meeting on 23rd of December 1797 lasted just five minutes, during which Bonaparte asked for further materials on Ireland. Tone noted, his manner is cold, he speaks very little. It is not, however, so dry as that of General Osh, but seems rather to proceed from languor than anything else. He is perfectly civil, but from anything we have yet seen or heard, it is impossible to augur anything good or bad. We have now seen the greatest man in Europe three times, and I am astonished how little I have to record about him. Yet after all, it is a droll thing that I should become acquainted with Bonaparte. A final meeting took place on the 13th of January, 98. Bonaparte recorded that he and Edward Lewins, another United Irishman, met Bonaparte and handed over further memoranda and maps to him. Tone told him that the United Irishmen in, Fran in Paris were eager to be involved in any invasion of Ireland. Finally, writes Tone, I spoke of myself. He expressed his great desire to be on the staff for the forthcoming invasion. Bonaparte assured him that he would be. But then Tone made a shamefaced disclosure. He had no military experience or knowledge, to which Bonaparte replied in a phrase which I imagine was to set Irish nationalist hearts pounding during the 19th century, may vous êtes brave, but you're brave. <laughs> Napoleon modestly replied that the that Tone modestly replied that when the opportunity offered, he hoped that would be the case to which Bonaparte rejoined, eh bien, cela suffit, that's fine. They parted never to meet again. Napoleon, within a matter of months, would go off to Egypt, not Ireland, while Tone, in a reckless move, sailed for Ireland in October 98, only to be captured and dying in prison by his own hand. Twelve years later, 1810, Tone's widow, Matilda, had an encounter with Napoleon. Since her husband's death, she had lived quietly in France, existing on the pension paid to her by the French government, awarded only after some fairly severe prompting by Lucien Bonaparte, Napoleon's brother. She had spent her time caring for her family, but had suffered the heartache of seeing all of her children, except for William, die of consumption. William was to be her sole surviving child, and she was determined that when he came of age, he would be enrolled in the Imperial Army's prestigious School of Cavalry. Accordingly, in 1810, she applied to the Duke de Feltre, the Minister of War, to place her son there. Now, de Feltre, formerly known as uh, Henry Clark, Henri Clark, was of Irish Jacobite stock, and he had worked with Theobald Wolfe Tone in preparation for a French invasion of Ireland. But despite these connections, he felt he owed the Tones no special favours, and he ruled that young William would become an officer cadet in Napoleon's Irish Legion, at that time serving in Spain. With formidable resolve, Matilda decided to bring her case to the Emperor Napoleon's attention. 
Now, it was well known that when in Paris, Napoleon hunted regularly in the forest of Saint-Germain. And so Matilda conceived a plan, in effect, to ambush the emperor when his carriage halted to change horses and to thrust a bound, a bound essay by William, along with her memorial, into his hands. So Matilda continues, Very soon the carriage with the emperor and empress drove into the circle in the forest. The horses were changed as quick as I had thought, but I stepped up and presented the book and the memorial. The emperor took them and, handing the book to his groom, opened the paper. I have said it commenced by recalling tone to his memory. When Napoleon began to read, he said, Tone, with an expressive accent. I remember him well, je me souviens bien. Napoleon quizzed Matilda about her circumstances and she described her modest life at Saint-Germain and explained further about her son. The emperor promised to look into the matter and his carriage departed. The incident was the talk of Saint-Germain. Who was that strange woman who had taken the emperor of, Napo of France by his collar? Matilda's tone, Matilda Tone's effort proved successful for William obtained his government scholarship and he never did serve in the Irish Legion. Napoleon's later dealings with the United Irishmen proved less happy. After the failure of the 1798 rebellion, the non-arrival of a large French force, the remnants of the United Irishmen were reluctant to put too much trust in French promises of further assistance. Robert Emmett travelled to France in the aftermath of the 1798 rebellion and made contact with leading members of the consulate. It is unclear whether he ever met Napoleon. His biographers are divided in this point. It seems highly unlikely. There is no evidence whatsoever to support a meeting. We can be confident that Robert Emmett and others did meet French officials, but the abiding impression they took away from his contacts was one of deep suspicion concerning French intentions towards Ireland. Thomas Addis Emmett, Robert's eldest brother, hated Napoleon for having, as he saw it, betrayed republicanism and he doubted whether Napoleon had ever any intention of liberating Ireland. Curiously, Arthur O'Connor, a bitter enemy of Thomas Addis Emmett, also denounced what he called that enemy of anything like liberty, Bonaparte. Robert Emmett came to share this verdict. However, despite the doubts over Napoleon's intention, or over whether or not he and Robert Emmett had ever met, Irish nationalists in the late 19th century had no, no hesitation about pressing Robert Emmett and Napoleon Bonaparte into their patriotic iconography. When the legend and the facts conflict, print the legend. <laughs> Finally, in terms of, at least of the historical record, we come to the Irish Legion, renamed in 1809 the 3 Regiment Etranger Irlandais, the third foreign regiment Irish, which was raised by Napoleon Bonaparte on the resumption of war in 1803 and was disbanded in 1815. The Irish Legion story is not a happy one. It had an undistinguished, not to say unfortunate, history. No Fontenoy adorns its battle honours. And while its officers were at least initially um, Irish-born or of Irish extraction, its rank and file consisted of Poles, Polish and Prussian um, conscripts with a leavening of British, Irish and Scottish deserters or former prisoners of war. Above all, the Legion, the Irish Legion, in its short history, had a notorious reputation for indiscipline, insubordination, and rancorous feuding that left at least one man dead, a number wounded, and caused others to give up and resign in despair. At least one colonel deserted to the British Army. It was raised specifically to serve in Ireland, but of course never saw action in that country, and instead spent its early years kicking its heels in enforced idleness in Brittany whence a lot of its problems, I think. All in all, its disbandment under the restored Bourbons, possibly at the insistence of Lord Castlereagh, comes as something of a relief from its scrabbles and factionalism. Now, little of these disputes, of course, was known about in Ireland, nor indeed of Napoleon's vagueness where Ireland was concerned. On the contrary, despite a concerted British effort to demonize him in pamphlet, broadside and print, and to detail the misery visited on the countries he had invaded, the Irish Catholic reaction to Napoleon's exploits, adventures and victories was overwhelmingly positive. French attacking, the Maid of La Vendée, and then a glorious victory. So the good deal of propaganda would then to try and put, get Irish opinion on track that Bonaparte was a menace to world civilization, to really to very little avail. 
The success of Bonaparte on the continent has occasioned great joy and exultation among many of the Catholics, wrote one official in 1806. Another reported that the country people are becoming greater politicians and they meet in clubs to read the accounts of Bonaparte. Agrarian insurgents in County Waterford drank health and success to Bonaparte. Elsewhere, the toast was Bonaparte and our religion. Very bizarre. And despite the best efforts of some Catholic priests who labelled Napoleon an infidel and an ogre, his treatment of the Pope and the Catholic Church was comprehensively ignored. In fact, wrote one Dublin Castle official rather wearily, quote, if Bonaparte could bring the Pope to the top of Tara Hill and guillotine him there in the face of the day, he would not lose 10 followers for it. <laughs> the progress of the war in Spain was followed with rapt attention by both Dublin Castle and the whole population of Ireland, understood to mean the Catholics. People, even poor people, claimed the next 1798 rebellion talk and think of nothing but Napoleon's successes and the expected invasion. The minds of all parties in the Catholic body are directed towards events in Spain. Whenever any bad news arrived from the Iberian Peninsula, wrote the Orange champion John Gifford in 1809, quote, the walls in Dublin are measly covered with placards and you can see joy in every popish countenance, insolence in their eyes and malice in their manner. When things are better as they are supposed to be now, all is stillness and tranquility. Five years on, 1814 or so, the prospect, quote, on the continent has again brightened, wrote Lord Sidmouth to Peel, and the barometer of turbulence and disaffection on your side of the water has, I suppose, again fallen. And Whitworth, the Lord left in it, looked forward to the end of Bonaparte as it would be the best remedy for Irish disaffection. Accordingly, news of Bonaparte's escape from Elba and the ensuing hundred days of frenzied political, diplomatic and military activity was all followed avidly in Ireland. The lower orders, it was reported, were highly gratified at Bonaparte's progress. This had caused a ferment in Ireland. Nor were the disaffected in Ireland all that cast down by Bonaparte's defeat and exile to St Helena, or so it was claimed. In September 1815, remember, three months after Waterloo, it was said that the insurgents in Tipperary still expect Bonaparte. And in November of that year, William Gregory, undersecretary, wrote that the disaffected still clung to the absurd idea of French help, which was a result of false prophecies circulated among them for the purposes of delusion. But even before Waterloo, 200 years ago this year, Napoleon Bonaparte had passed into legend in Ireland. In France and in Britain, the Napoleonic legend may have rested almost entirely on his actions during the Hundred Days, the brief period between Elba and, and, uh, his, and Waterloo, when the great man attempted to follow what might be called a liberal agenda in French politics. So much for France and Britain. But in Ireland, long before this, he was seen as a messianic figure, destined to bring deliverance to the Irish. And this idea of a deliverer from abroad was, of course, a well-trodden road in Irish history. In 1810, near Dunlavin in County Wicklow, a large crowd gathered to hear a poet, one Doyle. At the reading, or possibly the singing, two figures duly appeared, none other than Napoleon and his empress in effigy. And in August 1815, as news of Bonaparte's fall was being confirmed, at a gathering near Oma, County Tyrone, a Catholic leader, one Rafferty, addressed the crowd. Those that stick well with me, boys, shall get a townland in some part of Ireland. The crowd then cheered him, at first called him King James, and afterwards Bonaparte. As is well known, Napoleon was accompanied to St Helena by Dr Barry O'Mara, an Irish medical doctor who had been trained in the College of Surgeons in Dublin and then served in the Royal Navy. Apparently, Napoleon was taken with O'Mara's command of Italian, which of course was Bonaparte's first language, and asked for him to stay on. And the two men became what we might call respectful friends. Now, St Helena was little more than a chunk of volcanic rock in the South Atlantic, populated by large numbers of pink-eyed rats and with an inhospitable climate. The governor, Hudson Lowe, might have been Irish-born, he was born in Galway, but he quickly turned against his fellow Irishman, O'Mara, Lowe was above all else a martinet and a deeply insecure man who feared an attempt would be made to rescue Bonaparte. 
and to prevent such an escape, he would make Napoleon's life miserable and visit as much humiliation on him as possible. He insisted that O'Mara, as a British officer, must forget his duty to his patient and spy on the emperor, relate everything that passed concerning the emperor, which O'Mara refused to do. Until 1818, when O'Mara was sacked, a battle of wits ensued between the doctor and the governor. But it was O'Mara who had the last laugh. Removed from his position and then cashiered from the Royal Navy with loss of pension, O'Mara wrote up his detailed diaries of his stay in St Helena and published them in 1822 as Napoleon in Exile or A Voice from St Helena. The work like that of De Las Cases on Napoleon's Exile, Memorial de Saint Hélène, was received enthusiastically by an English reading public in England and in Ireland that had remained fascinated by Napoleon. O'Mara became the authentic source of quotations and opinions that the general public, starved of news of, of Napoleon, wanted to hear. The French Revolution offered, according to Napoleon, as reported by O'Mara, the career open to talents. The English were nothing but a nation of shopkeepers, according to O'Mara, via relating what Bonaparte had said. And as for the military, with perhaps a nod at Theobald Wolf tone, I love a brave soldier who has undergone a baptism of fire, whatever nation he may belong to. Now, curiously, Bonaparte, for the most part, treated O'Mara as if he was an English officer and seemed scarcely to recognise that he was Irish. And sadly, the Emperor's much quoted regret that he had not invaded Ireland instead of Russia, a quotation that found its way into the late 19th century patriotic Irish history book, the Kiltartan history book, owes its origins to de las Cas, to remit his reminiscences, not to those of O'Mara. More relevant, perhaps certainly more pertinent, was Napoleon's verdict on the United Irishmen that he had encountered. O'Mara revealed that he was dismissive of them. Quote, if the Irish had sent over honest men to me, I would certainly have made an attempt upon Ireland. But I had no confidence in either the integrity or the talents of the Irish leaders that were in France. They could offer no plan, were divided in opinion, and were continually quarrelling with one another. <coughs> I had but a poor opinion of that O'Connor, Arthur O'Connor, who was, who was so much spoken of amongst you. As for Theobald Wolfe Tone, despite the Je m'en souviens bien of earlier times, he figures nowhere in Napoleon's table talk, nor indeed can I find any reference to him in Napoleon's voluminous correspondence published uh, posthumously. O'Mara's book had a huge success, and his earnings from it, and from the rapid French translation, more than compensated him for his loss of employment and his loss of pension. Hudson Lowe sued for libel, but the case collapsed because of delays. In quick order, O'Mara's fortunes improved even further when he married the much older Lady Theodosia Lee, nay Broughton, a wealthy and twice married widow. Her first husband had been hanged for murdering her brother and her second marriage ended in divorce. O'Mara was taken up by the Whig opposition, centred on, on Holland House, and he was befriended by Daniel O'Connell, who regarded Napoleon as, quote, an unfortunate great man. O'Mara went on to help found the new Reform Club. He died in 1836, apparently of a chill caught at one of O'Connell's meetings. Long before then, Napoleon Bonaparte had passed from history into mythology. In death, he was to achieve a reputation, an apotheosis even, that had been denied or disputed in his lifetime. He achieved this not just in France, but also in many parts of the world, including Ireland. <coughs> I want now to move away from sort of the historical record to look at some of the ways in which Ireland was remembered, in the way in which Napoleon Bonaparte was remembered in Ireland in the 19th century, in ballads, in folklore, in folk plays, even in novels, in the theatre, and in the late 19th and early 20th century in film. Numerous <coughs> ballads were composed in Ireland relating to Napoleon Bonaparte, vivid testimony, testimony to his hold on the public imagination long after his death. Some of, these, some of these ballads were written in England, where something like a cult of Napoleon existed until the 1850s, and were then adapted to Irish circumstances. Some were older Irish ballads or poems, for the latter were frequently sung rather than recited, and were duly updated to include Bonaparte. 
And here, it must be remembered that a central theme in Irish poetry was the notion of deliverance of Ireland by foreign intervention. At one time, it was James II, or Bonnie Prince Charlie would be the deliverer, or the Messiah who would free Ireland. Now Bonaparte passed seamlessly into this tradition. Here is one song from the 1850s. One, sad, one night sad and languid I lay in my bed, and I scarce had reclined in my pillow. When a vision surprising came into my head, I thought I was crossing the billow. It's not great poetry. But anyway, Napoleon appears and then makes the claim. On the plains of Marengo, I tyranny hurled. I unfolded, unfurled my eagle. Twas the standard of freedom. To liberty's temple I guided mankind. I, and slavery I sought to keep under. The fetters of bondsmen I oft did unbind. And the tyrant's treaties I tore them asunder. This image of Bonaparte as universal liberator, friend of the people, was, and Democrat was being created and cemented and passed on to posterity. Some years ago, the late Frank Hart with Donald Lunny produced a double CD entitled My Name is Napoleon Bonaparte, which consisted of 26 Irish ballads on Napoleon. And Frank Clark in his introduction says that they left out as many more, maybe three times as many. They included songs such as The Bonnie Bunch of Roses, which is quite a tricky song, but The Bonnie Br Bunch of Roses seems to refer to the British Army. The Green Linnet, others are quite straightforward. Napoleon's Farewell to Paris, I Am Napoleon Bonaparte, and personal favourite, Napoleon is the boy for kicking up a row. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of these were tributes to Bonaparte. Some were traditional anti-war songs, and several lamented that Napoleon had been the cause of the death of a loved one who had taken the king's shilling and enlisted in the British army, only to perish or suffer mutilation. A great deal of play is made with going out with a fine pair of legs and coming back with a fine pair of pegs, um, which is kind of gruesome, but pegs and legs, are too you couldn't leave those aside. As a result, for example, of the Battle of Waterloo, but most of them were a lament for the lost hero, the, the green linnet, a gallant ally who would surely one day return to sting the bonny bunch of roses, i.e. the British Army. James Joyce, or Bloom, was sufficiently impressed to list Napoleon in Ulysses as one of, quote, many Irish heroes and heroines of antiquity. He li listed him alongside Shane O'Neill, Father Murphy, and Theobald Wolfe Tone. But Bloom rather spoils it then by including in his roll call of heroes the last of the Mohicans, the man who broke the bank at Monte Carlo, <laughs> and the Queen of Sheba. <laughs> but more to the point, Joyce describes Leopold Bloom in a very telling point as sporting a Napoleonic forelock, which obviously indicates that people knew what Bonaparte looked like or purported to look like. Irish balladry could be said to have kept Bonaparte's name alive and to have, helped create, to have helped in the creation of the image of Napoleon as a benevolent ruler and liberal democrat. And so, do, so too did the popular memory of Bonaparte as revealed in the records of Irish folklore. A search through the Folklore Archive at the Department of Irish Folklore at UCD reveals a significant number of references to Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, Daniel O'Connell, the liberator, the deliverer, has a huge mass of references in folklore. Oliver Cromwell, curiously, is second. Um, but Napoleon is a respectable third, ahead of Wolf Tone and ahead of Emmett. In Irish folklore, certain stories about Napoleon appear that were to be found elsewhere in Europe. For example, that he was unaffected and had simple tastes, that he was gentle to his soldiers, no flogging as in Wellington's army and he allowed his men to address him using the familiar two. A story which is very common in France, but found in Ireland and elsewhere, was that Napoleon had never in fact died, or in Irish folklore, near Caillouet or Rio. He never died. Interestingly, and by way of confirmation, a French traveler in Ireland in the 1840s was told by a turf cutter that Napoleon was not dead. Quote, that fellow in St. Helena was not really him at all. Bonaparte was hidden away in some impenetrable place, a bit like Luke Skywalker perhaps, and would emerge when the time had come. Other stories represented Napoleon as the all-forgiving, 
wise ruler, literally a gentleman. Here's a story from West Kerry, Irish-speaking area, collected in the 1930s, and far, far in a chulla, the sleeping sentry, a story that is found elsewhere in Europe. It begins, we can't more to your Bonaparte lish in the Slough Franco, because the Austrians, Urs and Idoil. It was a big battle one time between the French and the Austrian armies in Italy. The Austrians defeated, and the day went to the French. That night, the French slept soundly in the open air, and Bonaparte posted sentries around him in case the Austrians returned. Just before midnight, Bonaparte rose from his bed to check that everything was in order. On his walk around the camp perimeter, he came across a sentry fast asleep with his musket on the ground. Napoleon took up the sentry's weapon and stood guard in his stead. After about an hour, the sentry awoke and was startled to find that his musket was missing. He was also taken aback to see Bonaparte in front of him with the gun in his hand. Understandably, he reckoned that he would pay dearly for his transgression. But no, gentle Napoleon merely said that he understood that the sentry was tired after the hard day's battle. No harder battle was ever fought, but that from now on he had to do his duty, for the enemy might yet destroy them with a surprise attack. The sentry thanked Napoleon, resumed his post, and never again failed in his duty. Here's another example, I think a fairly delightful one, if a little bit puzzling in what it signifies, of the meek and mild emperor. It was collected as part of the nationwide Irish folklore schools scheme undertaken in 1938. By March 1939, some 40,000 copy books had been submitted, and it's entitled Napoleon and His Bird. Long, long ago, when Napoleon was advancing on Moscow, he had a small bird that sang in his table every morning at breakfast. One morning he asked for it, but the sergeant said it was dead, and Napoleon was very sad, for he'd grown to like it. When an old clockmaker saw how sad he was about his bird, he said he would make him a clockwork one that would sing for him every morning. So after three weeks, the old clockmaker brought an artificial bird that sung when he wound it. Then Napoleon said that he would like five more. That way he could set all six singing together. That's the puzzle. <laughs> one day when my father was in the city, he was lucky enough to buy one, and it still sings its song since the clockworker made it, told to me by my father. Finally, there's the public memory of Napoleon, Josephine, Marengo, and the Battle of Waterloo. In numerous reenactments, restaging, circus acts, and popular melodrama, Napoleon, or a version of him and his entourage, lived on long after his death. For example, even when he's on St. Helena in 1816, to great acclaim, his carriage was exhibited in London, along with his personal wardrobe, his horses, and his Dutch coachman, Jan Horn. The exhibition later moved to Dublin, where it was equally enthusiastically received. Among other examples of the Irish public's fixation with Napoleon, we may note the curious, not to say bizarre, exhibition that was offered in the 1840s at number 153 Capel Street, Dublin. This was nothing less than a beautiful mechanical group entitled The Death of Napoleon. Apparently it was some sort of a machine complete with tubes, compressed air and various models resembling to uh, Bonaparte's deathbed. It sort of underlines the macabre Victorian obsession with the last moments of great men and it promised a breathtaking experience in which the deathbed scenes would be reenacted. Quote, Napoleon is shown lying on a correct model of his famous bedstead, surrounded by his attendants and his confessor. He opens and shuts his eyes, he turns his head on the pillow, his chest heaves, his breathing is very languid. This melancholy scene defies description. It must be seen to be duly appreciated. Other playbills advertise the reenactment of Waterloo using regular soldiers of the Dublin garrisons as extras and with loud explosions promised. And as always, Marengo, Napoleon, Josephine and Wolf Tone were very much in evidence. And many times Edward Alexander Gomersal, an actor who bore an uncanny likeness to Bonaparte and who made an entire lifetime career out of playing him, took the lead role. One of them, Battle of Waterloo, the Horse Marengo. 
death of the Duke of Brunswick, explosion of ammunition wagons, and the horse Marengo. And you can see this is sort of a Queen's Royal Theatre. Um, various acts are offered, 1840s. Then you, one of them was an R with Napoleon. Um, you know, what, what you would want an R with Napoleon for anyway. This one didn't come out too well, but it's, it's a classic of Wolf Tone. It's a Kennedy Miller's idea of Wolf Tone's life. Um, what are we looking at here? Take this one. Is firing squad shooting two people. It, Tone is asked in the play to shoot um, two informers, but he gallantly refuses. So the French put the informers up against the wall and have a firing squad. In the last scene, Bonaparte and Josephine and Theobald Wolf Tone get on the ship together and sail off. And th this sort of muddled history was part of the staple fare of the popular music hall in late 19th century, early 20th century Ireland. And as I say, Kennedy Miller was the one who staged a remarkable number of these um, in his Queen's Theatre, Brunswick Street. Among them, Peep of Day, Theobald Wolfe Tone, A True Son of Era, The Ulster Hero and Sarsfield, and so on. All were there. By coincidence, the play Napoleon and Josephine, there's Mr. Gomersall, Bonaparte, If you look at that quite clearly, you'll see that it opens on Easter Saturday, the 22nd of April, 1916. And uh, I'm tempted after what Professor Lee said to me earlier on, that maybe this was the occasion when, on Easter Monday, Josephine says to Napoleon, will, will we go on tonight? And to which he said, not tonight, Josephine. <laughs> So as I say, the play opened on Easter Saturday. Um, it shut down, obviously, and reopened about three weeks later. Um, but to an Ireland that had changed dramatically as a result of the Easter Rising, obviously. And so my rather simple point is that, is it too much to suggest that this preoccupation, amounting to an obsession with Napoleon Bonaparte and his times and his contemporaries, and by extension, a corresponding familiarity with the notion of deliverance from abroad, rendered a role by our gallant allies in Europe all that easier to contemplate and to accept. Thank you very much. Well, we've had an intriguing presentation from any number of angles that nobody could anticipate, I imagine. So, time for questions or observations or comments or anything else like that from, from any angles? Can I ask a serious question? My yep. like that. Um, I'm, I was intrigued at the very end when you were talking when you had Waterloo. And I'm wondering about the reception in the Irish newspapers, which of course at that time would have been a very select group indeed. But given what we now know about the number of Irish fighting on the British side at Waterloo, yeah. Yeah. Was, was, was that dimension of Waterloo, was that, was that referred to in those, in those comments? Have, have you been to them? Or was this regarded as straight French versus English? And with us on the no. French side, so to speak, or how, or how did it go? It, it, it's brought up many times in parliamentary debates, 1815, 1816, and continually for the next 10 or 15 years, Irish MPs who would be in favour of Catholic emancipation would bring up the Irish contribution to the defeat of Bonaparte and say that, you know, why aren't they being rewarded um, for their exertions during the war? And Waterloo, obviously, but that would be the one way it would be done. The big contrast for me, though, is the way the Scottish soldiers and the Irish soldiers are treated as a result. The Scottish soldiers play a very small role in uh, Waterloo, but they get a triumphant procession through Edinburgh. They're immortalised on various paintings. They have all sorts of battle honours accorded them, and they're cried up as if they won the battle. The Irish soldiers who were at the sharp end of the battle and suffered very heavy casualties were ignored. And I think the reason was that to accord them any recognition might mean conceding the point that they ought to be rewarded for Catholic emancipation. The, the irony of it was that on the one hand saying the Irish fought very well, uh, let's move on. The Irish fought very well, but that doesn't mean we can make any move on Catholic emancipation. So that, that would be the way it would go. 
Yes, two questions there. Is there a list of the Irishmen who fought for Napoleon and the Irish who fought in the British Army during D the time? There is actually a list of the Irishmen who fought for Napoleon. Um, there, it's in the French military archives, but it's, you know, it, it, once you get it, it's quite straightforward to read the list. They were in the Irish Legion, um, and uh, there's not that many of them. I'm guessing maybe 100 tops, but you can... And, They've been, they've been written about and written up in various articles, so you could find out who they were. The, the, the Irish Legion had Irish officers. By and large, it did not have Irish rank and file. It, the rank and file were usually Polish or Prussian or deserters or whatever, but the, the officer corps was Irish, and it, but that became diluted as the 18.5 became 18.8, 18.10, and so on. Um, but those officers' names are all well listed and could be found. Yeah. As for the Irish in Napoleon's ar in Wellington's army, yes, they, that can be retrieved, but there's a lot of them. You know, we're looking at tens of thousands. And um, you know, the British army by 1815 is well over a couple of hundred thousand. So, and the Irish are about 40% of that, which puts them at about 80,000. So there's a, you know, there's a huge number, and they're scattered through maybe 50 or 60 regiments. So there's a, you know, there'd be, a, it'd be a, an arduous task to sort of try and pick out all the Irish from the various regiments. Because even the Irish regiments, even the English regiments, have large numbers of Irish uh, recruits. So it's a large amount of work involved there. Uh, you had mentioned about the ballads that they sang. Now, I, this is probably a Tin Pan Alley. Uh, my father used to sing The Wearing of the Green, hmm. all about Napper Tandy, took me by the hand, blah, blah, blah. But uh, that's not one of your ballads, right? That's a Tin Pan Alley well, it's, ballad? Well, it, so, it, it, again, it again comes from that period. I mean, Napper Tandy is in, is in Paris in the 1790s. He was an Irish radical, an Irish revolutionary. Um, you know, he had all sorts of ca character faults and perhaps wasn't as great as he made himself out to be. He fought with Wolf Tone. Um, absolute, complete sunder between Wolf Tone's friends and Napper Tandy's friends in Paris. And it's possible that was what Bonaparte was referring to, that you know, the Irish quarrelled among themselves. And it is true. Thomas Addis, or Thomas Addis Emmett and Arthur O'Connor, bitter rivals, um, wanted to fight, fought a duel, actually. Um, pursued a rivalry from Ireland to Scotland to France. Um, and uh, Napper Tandy and, and Theobald Wolfe Tone were, never could see eye to eye. So they, you know, there was no one voice amongst the Irish exiles in Paris looking for a French invasion. And that's possible, possibly what Bonaparte was referring to. Because a word of that would have got to him. Yeah? What did the Irish fight in such numbers with the British Army? Was it the pay? Was it patriotism? Or was it something else? Well, why did the Irish fight so much in the British Army? Um, Ireland is not unlike other countries in Europe which had underdeveloped economy in which there was not a lot of work for able-bodied men. There was also, I think, an Irish martial tradition um, which inclines people to think of being a, becoming a soldier. Certainly the economic aspects of becoming a soldier would, would be there, but th there's a sort of a package of motivations um, which I, I would, you know, I'd, I'd sketch in five or six of them rather than just say they enlist for the king's shilling. That was the way it was put, and certainly the king's shilling was important. But there would have been other reasons. Family tradition, maybe the father had been in the army, um, maybe a brother was in the army, maybe the local area was an, was an area in which there was a garrison and which people could see soldiers and think, well, I wouldn't mind doing that, that looks all right. You know, things like that have an influence on choices that people make to join the army. They, they're recruited. A major way of recruiting within the Irish army, within the British army, was to use the Irish militia, which was a sort of a home guard, served in their own counties, or adjacent counties or whatever, to use them as a sort of a nursery for the regular army. So that after maybe six months of being a militiaman and marching up and down, you would then be inveigled into signing up to join the regular army. So it's hard to know just what, what, what's at play there. Maybe they just liked um, becoming soldiers. 
because the stream of recruits into the British Army um, from the 1790s until 1900 or thereabouts is extraordinary. Um, and really, it's a, you know, a much under, underwritten sort of aspect of Irish history, given you know, it's, a lot of attention is paid to the Irish in Napoleon's army, the Irish in various other continental armies, but the Irish in the British army are huge, huge numbers, but comparatively neglected. Yeah. Uh, one of the disadvantages of having a rich cultural heritage seems to be the possibility for the spread of misinformation as far as history is concerned, and that's not limited to the Irish. But I'm curious about um, the song, the, yeah, the yeah. album that the Chieftains put together. Am I not using No, you're this? okay. You're okay. Yeah. You can hear. The album that the Chieftains put together. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm missing it all. I must be the only place in the room that can't hear. Um, the album that the Chieftains... The album that the Chieftains put together. Okay. The album that the Chieftains put together. In the 1980s. Right. Called Bonaparte's Retreat. Right. Yeah. What... What was the actual historical tie there? I mean, is there any factual link between this music and um, and and the Napoleonic Wars at all? Well, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a it's a pretty specialized question. I wouldn't I wouldn't have just. Oh, I thought but that. But the, the 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 music, a lot of it, it undergoes all sorts of transformations. Some of the some of the pro Bonaparte ballads start off as uh, British army tunes, regimental marching tunes, which then get lifted into the popular, and then get the wording changed, and sometimes the music changed, and then come back to Ireland, and then become Irish tunes. And also Irish tunes go to England and become part of English tunes. There's a, a whole literature on the folk song, and you know, it's quite instructive to look at it, the way that you think that classically Irish tunes are just that. It turns out that, in fact, they're from English tunes, and similarly, English tunes originated in Ireland and then were transformed and adapted to new purposes so that, and then were passed off as English and became English in people's minds. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting way in which these traditions, these musical traditions, move from one country to another. Um, the Bonnie Bunch of Roses um, is a classic one. My understanding is that it was originally a British Army marching tune, which then became it was then adapted um, by in Ireland, and the Bonnie Br Bunch of Roses came to signify the British Army, and then various lines were attached to it, which indicated that Bonaparte would come along and defeat the Bonnie Bunch of Roses. The Bonnie Bunch of Roses may, being a reference to the redcoats of the British Army. It's, as I say, there's an extensive literature on it, and if you Google um, British folk songs, you'll get a whole rake of references to them. Could I ask Tom, did you have, we were talking about the British Army, if I were right, did you have to be English speaking to join the army, were there Irish speaking units, or how, how did the language, did the language issue arise? The, the numbers we're talking about who were in the army at yeah. that time, when how many would have been coming from Still the, the, those who joined the army would have been, I, I guess, predominantly Irish speaking, but it, they would have been bilingual to an extent. That is to say, the Irish would have been for the cosy, for the familiar, the domestic. For the men in their barracks would talk Irish. But on the parade ground, it would have been um, different. Now, having said that, um, you know, in a book that we were both involved in, you know, I, I do publish a, a, pro a proclamation or a poster which the British Army put out in 1806, mm -hmm. you know, advertising for recruits, ask the Liga, you know, they, they, they actually produce a whole thing saying, here are the terms and conditions you will achieve, all in Irish in 1806. But that but, almost uh, implies that it literally, literally was in Irish. Hmm. Literacy, literacy in the language is a huge problem, as distinct from, you know, obviously facilitating what's spoken. Absolutely, language. yeah. We're yeah. very advanced in many ways. Yeah, it, it does imply that people could read. Um, I don't know how successful that was. It's the only example of an Irish language poster, uh, you know, in, inviting people to join the British Army that I've ever seen, and that's from 1806. This chap here. Uh, 
Um, forgive me if you covered this. I came in a few minutes late, but um, you want to? Yeah. My understanding is that the agricultural census in 1803 was taken. Was it cool to hear She said, "Yeah." yeah. My understanding. <laughs> my understanding um, is that the agricultural census in 1803 was taken to um, see what resources were available, and so I was wondering whether, among Irish Catholics, the rural population, whether there was actually a fear of Napoleon as well, alongside this kind of embrace with the Catholic identity. And so yeah, that, that's a fair enough question. Is there a fear of Napoleon? The, there's a large number of pamphlets, broadsides, and prints, cartoons, and so on, which were produced between about 1800 and 1806, 1807. After, after Trafalgar, not so many. But the whole thrust of them was, look at what Napoleon has done in Italy. Look at what he's done in Germany. Look at what he's done in the Netherlands. He'll do the same to you. Um, Bonaparte was ridiculed as being venereal, you know, that this was the venereal disease that was going to come here. There's nothing for the faint hearted, it's full on, lurid um, sort of demonization of Bonaparte. It doesn't seem to have had any effect whatsoever. In theory, Bonaparte's treatment of the Pope should have aroused Irish Catholic indignation. But as one guy says, one of the Dublin Castle officials, if he'd guillotined the Pope, he wouldn't lose anyone in Ireland. You know, they, they are just totally fixated on him. And as an image in Irish history, as a person, a person in Irish history that they were familiar with and which they try to keep going through the 19th century, down to the Easter Week proclamation. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a fascinating presentation. Um, I was just wondering, was Wolf Tone um, able to speak fluent French and in terms of communication with the French leadership and uh, with uh, Napoleon in particular, um, how were the, the language um, issues ironed out? Was it through interpretation or what way did it work? Thank yeah, you. That, that's a good question. There's a, 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 some substantial, very competitive literature on Bonaparte's French, um, his ability to speak French. He claims he couldn't speak it all that well and yet Others who have studied his proclamations and the way that he addressed clearly say that he clearly could speak good French. There's no real indication of, a, um, of an interpreter at his side. In fact, there is none. Um, and it's, I think it's pretty much accepted now that Napoleon, or that, that Theobald Wolfe Tone, had a very good command of French. He, Tone has a way to disparage his abilities. He's, Always, he has no military experience, but he had some military experience. He never did this, but you know, he was a hopeless lawyer, but he actually wasn't that bad a lawyer. You know, he sort of always runs himself down, so when he says my French is execrable, it's not to be taken literally. Um, he doesn't seem to have needed an interpreter. I mean, he gets in to see Carnot in the minister, French Ministry of War just by walking in the front door and saying, I want to see the French Minister of War and he's brought in to meet him. It's, you know, it's sort of weird, but that, that's the way it was. Um, so I think his French was good, yeah. Okay, well I think we've had a fascinating, very enjoyable. Thank you very much.